Thank you. Thank you for in inviting me. And uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel um, and especially appreciate um, starting with the words from Jen, I think, who uh, helps to put all of this in context. Um, and then along with my federal colleagues, uh, I do thank you. As I, I looked um, at the title of the presentation, which uh, was, a, was a, a bit long, reflecting to the forced evolution of COVID-19 and applying innovation to a new normal. Um, I had to think about it and kind of broke it down into three phrases. The first thing that stuck out with me was the word reflecting. Um, the second thing was forced evolution and innovation. And the third thing was applying this to the future. Uh, so I wanna kind of highlight those three areas today um, for the next few minutes um, as we go to the next slide, please. So um, really ref the first word being reflecting. And um, when, when we heard that COVID-19 was, was entering um, in other countries, uh, we immediately, uh, we began uh, to look at this and to monitor it. And around February 6th, we released the first coronavirus infection control and prevention guidance. Um, and this was similar to a guidance that we released for Ebola, H1N1. It kind of reminded everybody about infection control practices and those kinds of things. But at the time, we had no idea of the impact that it would have on this country. Um, it was in at the end of February when we saw um, that there was the first outbreak in the nursing home and uh, was reported to us from the state health department of a significant number of respiratory infections and then working very closely with the CDC who went into the nursing home first um, and uh, did the surveillance activities that they needed to do. And then we followed them um, after we got our staff the appropriate PPE. Uh, again, all of our work has been closely coordinated with the FDA and CDC, um, NIH, uh, we, we came up with the rubric that we needed to try to keep COVID out of facilities um, to the extent that we could. And to the um, and if we could not, and, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, once it got in, we needed to prevent transmission. And then um, uh, and, and doing that, working with staff and residents, we needed to detect cases early to prevent transmission, and then uh, also implement infection control practices that would in fact mitigate um, some of the concerns with transmission. Um, next slide, please. So we are responsible uh, for the health and safety, in addition to nursing homes, of nearly um, 18 different areas, uh, clinical areas, be it home health, hospice, hospital, um, intermediate care facilities um, in coordination with the state. Uh, so we had to immediately begin to think of how do we interact with all of these different uh, provider types. And our attention quickly turned to the flexibilities that we would be able to provide once a public health emergency was declared on March 13th. And so the first thing that we did was begin to issue a series of blanket waivers. And a blanket waiver means that uh, individual facilities or state associations or um, hospitals, they don't have to apply. We issue it and then everybody can take advantage of it um, through our authority under the 1135 uh, part of the Social Security Act. Uh, so sometimes in, in uh, when we are preparing for, in, say, a flood or a hurricane, people have to individually ask for a waiver. This time we just said we're going to put everything out there because we want people to have the flexibility that they need to be able to attend to the needs of their um, clients, uh, patients, their residents, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the next word uh, um, after reflection was 
innovation and forced evolution. And we found ourselves in a position of having to do both of those things. Uh, we issued over 130 waivers, um, as I said, Medicare blanket waivers. And one of the things I wanna point out about with CMS and our conditions of participation, when we issue a waiver, it impacts um, Medicare and Medicaid, but in many instances, all payers, uh, because we have we set the minimum uh, safety standards and quality standards for, let's say if it's a hospital, it, we don't just set the minimum standards for Medicare patients, we set it for all patients. Uh, there are some waivers that are Medicare specific, and then for the states who have uh, the authority over the administration of their Medicare, uh, Medicaid programs, uh, we did issue uh, a number of amendments to 1135 waivers, 1115 disaster spas, um, and some of their IT funding requests. Over 150 of those were uh, administered so that states could have the flexibility in their programs to pay for such things as alternative care sites um, within the state or even to waive prior authorization. We heard at the beginning that these prior authorization uh, rules sometimes uh, presented barriers to care. So we provided flexibility so the states could override some of those prior authorization. Uh, next slide, please. We also, um, though we have authority under uh, the 1135, there are some things that cannot be uh, waived. Uh, and um, in the next slide, you'll see we had to issue a number of rules. Um, and they were rules that were put out where we couldn't just waive them. And they provided many flexibilities uh, in order to do telehealth. Um, and we added a number of codes, over a hundred and some codes that would allow for payment, not only for um, video, but also in some cases uh, for uh, telephone, uh, any kind of telecommunications technology um, in many areas where uh, internet is not easily accessible. We quickly heard that uh, we needed to be more flexible in that area, as well as uh, some of the um, other types of uh, communication. We also issued payment for laboratories to go to homebound patients um, to collect specimens so that they could have their fee for performing uh, the test, but also for collecting the test. And then ambulance, as we uh, did all of the alternative care sites, uh, patients had to have a way to get to those facilities. So uh, we expanded the kinds of coverage that could be paid for. We also looked at um, a number of, particularly uh, with rare um, conditions, a number of coverage determinations are made at the local level. Uh, and some are covered under national coverage decisions. So we had to make uh, rulemaking because we couldn't have, we couldn't waive it under 1135 authority to um, add flexibilities to some of the coverage decisions. So that, for example, if we had a clinical uh, coverage with evidence development where there was a clinical trial going on and it said you had to have do this many of this type of procedure in order for it to be covered, we, um, instead of looking at what, how, what was being covered during 2020, we just said, if you met the requirements in 2019, Team, we're just going to give you the credit for 2020 so that you can continue to cover those things um, that might be in some type of trial uh, without having to meet the various requirements there. Uh, next slide, please. And um, as and I mentioned nursing homes being the first place that uh, uh, we started to work and CMS has the uh, uh, responsibility by, by law to um, set the standards for nursing homes. Um, we continued to monitor what was going on uh, there and I mentioned uh, keeping it out, but you'll see that we, we quickly noted that uh, the, the rate in nursing homes was commensurate with what was happening in the community. So the, the blue line is nursing homes, the red line is what um, were ha was happening in the community, recognizing that uh, long-term care, there's a place of congregate settings and frailty there, um, that the, the rate was, was going up, but also it was coming in um, from other areas. Uh, so um, we had to do more to keep it out. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so we did issue a series of rules that required testing uh, at a certain um, regime for residents, as well as staff that were bringing um, in from the community. Uh, aside from nursing homes, we also established new requirements for hospitals and critical access hospitals under our conditions of participation to require reporting and also a certain number of um, of surveys and inspections and technical assistance. Uh, and, and, and all of this, you had to do a balancing act because on the one hand, um, we would hear from providers and clinicians, we don't have time to stop and do a survey or for a survey or an inspector to come in to see how we're doing our process. We're in the midst of taking care of patients or we're in the midst of, of helping our clients. On the other hand, we'd had advocates that says, you know, we can't get in we're in our homes. We don't know what's happening to our loved ones. Um, we um, expect you to be in there uh, looking to see what was going on. Uh, and so we tried to find the right balance of going into facilities, doing um, inspections, uh, but maybe focusing on their infection control processes and policies uh, versus the, uh, the entire universe of, of things that we received. We also revised our um, policies regarding who um, may receive the uh, COVID-19 tests without a physician order uh, so that people could have access to the testing immediately. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we also provided flexibilities as we now prepare for the vaccine, as we have talked about a little bit earlier, uh, that payment could be made, uh, uh, particularly on the Medicaid. We require states to cover the COVID-19 vaccine without cost sharing. And um, in order for them to be able to get the 6.2% uh, uh, federal match, uh, then it, it must be provided. We also made provisions for uh, Medicaid beneficiaries to remain enrolled um, and not be dropped from the roll in order to receive certain other incentives that are available through the uh, Family First Coronavirus um, Act. Next slide, please. So just a few weeks ago, and I, I've been monitoring the chat, and I saw a couple of questions about um, being a, able, to, able to get to tests that you need, like colonoscopies, being able to visit, being able to um, uh, have care in the home. And um, so, well, in March, we actually announced hospital without walls. And that allowed hospitals to be able to provide care in alternative settings, such as a convention center or, or um, some um, used uh, maybe hospitals, wings that have been closed to expand their capacity. Uh, in November, just before Thanksgiving, we expanded on this effort by executing an innovative, uh, innovative approach to acute care hospital at home so that hospital care could be paid at home. And this is for Medicare and, and the um, patient could be paid the DRG rate, uh, provided certain things were met, such as uh, remote monitoring and pharmacy services and being ensured that the patient could get food at home. There's a list of things that have to be done, but there are hospitals that are doing this. Um, and we also understood that at the state level for Medicaid or other payers, there were barriers that would prevent this kind of care, hospital at home care. So we did write a letter to governors encouraging them to um, please consider removing such barriers. Um, also as a part of the hospital without walls, we allowed ambulatory surgery centers to begin to temporarily certify themselves as hospitals. So that certain procedures and surgeries that normally um, may have been done in a hospital outpatient department or hospital, but had to be delayed so people couldn't get necessary care, could be done in an ambulatory surgery center. And one of the barriers was the 24-hour uh, care uh, to nursing, um, nursing home care. And we waived uh, some of that when patients didn't, uh, to nursing care, if you didn't have a, a nurse. So I know we're at time. Uh, next slide, I'm just about at the end. Um, uh, here. So the last part of this was, so then what are the applications for the future? I'll say we are uh, continuing to monitor the waivers, trying to balance what we can and cannot do uh, with waivers, what we should keep. People have asked us to keep the telehealth waivers, to keep certain other waivers. Um, 
at the same time, we implemented them so quickly, things that usually would take a year took weeks. We didn't have time to get good public input. So those are the things we didn't have time to get good quality data. So we have to look at all of that, but um, certainly we will never go back to business as usual and we will continue um, a, 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 to, to learn and to implement things that will really enhance uh, putting the patient and the client and the residents uh, at the center of care. Uh, thank you.